morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Agronomy in Action Insight Series. We appreciate you being with us this Thursday morning for a webinar hosted by Golden Harvest. Today, we'll be talking about genetics by environment by management, discussing how are you going to get the most out of your bag of corn seed. Today with us, we have two incredible presenters. We have Stephanie Smith and Brad Bernhardt. Stephanie Smith is our agronomy manager for Golden Harvest East. Uh, she has about 13 years of experience in the industry and is really well versed in this subject matter. Brad Bernhardt is one of our agronomic research scientists at Syngenta. He has been in the industry about five years now and he, can, he um, does a lot of research around this as well. So with that, we're gonna jump right into it this morning. Stephanie Smith is going to start off, so I'll pass the baton over to you, Stephanie. Thank you, Julia. Good morning, everyone. Happy February 2nd. Um, the groundhog in Pennsylvania did see his shadow this morning, so that does mean we have six more weeks of winter. And what better opportunity to spend those next six weeks than to truly sharpen the saw um, when it comes to agronomic advice and truly details on our farms that can affect ROI. So as we enter this arena, welcome to the arena of seed. Every farmer on in the market has six to 12 options on who they buy seed from. And many folks have many different reasons to why they buy that seed, whether it be relationship, whether it be yield driven off of plots, whether it be loyalty to a brand, so what we're going to spend a little bit of time on today is how we sort through that equation. Why do we buy? Because every seed company out there, you know, tells you we have the best hybrid for, for your area and your locale. Very similar to that movie a few years ago that 60% of the time we win every time. So how do we get through that equation? So what I wanted to focus on a little bit is the day that we go out and we plant those fields, we have high expectations on what that corn crop is gonna do. And we're very versed in the idea of our expectation is we don't go out to that field to plant to, in our minds, it's like, yes, we're gonna hit 150 bushels an acre. Our typical thought process is, hey, this is going to be the best year of growing corn in my entire life and I'm shooting for 250. So we go out there with high hopes and dreams when we go to plant. And then when we get through that planting season, perhaps something happens, something outside of our control. The corn goes down. It doesn't rain. We have tar spot that creeps in. There's always something in that agronomic equation that is not what we expected day one of, of planting that crop. So here's what I want you to, to consider. And I will self-confess today, I'm not going to give a lot of pointed direction, but truly this is meant to encourage you to think. Think about what can be done and what can we do. We know today the world record holder is David Hula. He's at 616 bushels an acre. There are countless farmers across the United States that plant that same hybrid, yet they haven't harvested 616 bushels an acre. So when we think about this equation for corn yield, sometimes it gets very difficult, but we really just like to break it down and, and stretch it apart to see which detail along that um, route to, to yield that we can positively affect. I want to get your mindset around what truly goes into a hybrid to become commercial. Okay, typically uh, there's seven or more years of research into each one of those hybrids. They're planted over a thousand plots to be able to get that data. And each seed company, whether it be Golden Harvest, they invest over a million dollars into each one of those hybrids. So when we think about our advancement process, you know, we have those first four years, they're small, they're in the lab. We're taking, um, we're taking DNA, we're taking a look and finding predictors uh, within that genome. When, when Golden Harvest talks about stage five and six, this is when we're going to larger, um, a little bit more commercial trials. We bring in helicopters to test green snap. We're out there um, with placement of starter fertilizers and management throughout the season, which Brad's going to talk quite a bit about. And then when we get to that stage seven, eight, nine, 
is when we, you know, we roll that out on, on major acreage across the United States. So what I hope that we accomplish today is we really think about the why of why didn't that hybrid work for me? You know, David Hulas planted a hybrid that, six, that yields 616 bushels an acre, but that hybrid didn't yield 616 for me. So what happened? At the base of all agronomy, I always like to come back to Liebig's Law of the Minimum. Okay, there's always some, there's the lowest stave in the barrel that's going to determine our yield. There's always going to be some factor. Um, typically across the United States, it can be water. But when we think about as we build out in, in the topic of today's talks, so a G by E by M, genetics by environment, by management, is there something within our control that we can do to raise that lower stave of the barrel? So again, to get you guys thinking a little bit, this is a photo I took um, of our genetic lineup of, of a, a couple years ago uh, across our Indiana hybrids that we have for offer. So I always like to pose the question of which hybrid would you choose? Okay, so when you think about that, you know, innately within our minds, we go to, well, which ear has the most kernel rows round by the, the, the longest length, by the biggest kernel size, right? So in our minds, we might think like, hey, this hybrid here across a couple different plots looks pretty darn good. And then you could challenge yourself with the comment, well, this one looks a lot smaller. Why would Golden Harvest bring this to market? We all know um, there's a lot invested into each one of these hybrids at this point. So it wouldn't make economic sense for a seed company, Golden Harvest or et cetera, to bring on a bad product, right? So what do we have to do? We need to make sure that we match the genetics by environment, by management. So with that concept, I'm, I'm going to ask for a little bit of your feedback on the call. The question I want to ask is what do you want to see in a corn hybrid? Some of these answers may seem very intuitive and some others you may push yourself to think, is this, is this truly important to my farming operation? Is, is this, this what's going to move the needle? The answer I, I anticipated when he did, um, about 80% of you guys said yield uh, was most important. Um, only trailing that by 4% is consistency. You know, standability here at 55, strong disease package at 41, and there's some other options here as well. So I really like this question because can you just select on yield? Can you just select on consistency? And I think once we develop that whole picture on what we need on our farms, I think we can all intuitively believe I need more than one thing. So when you think about corn breeding, when we think about you know placing each one of those hybrids in in the areas that we need, think about what Golden Harvest is, is doing to help categorize those hybrids before you plant them on your farm. Our research team that Brad is a part of, you know, we're going through here, we're focusing on population and fungicide response, right? We're focusing on fertility and within our energy markets and our non-energy markets, we're focusing on feedability of those products. We're also taking into consideration when we come through and, you know, with seed treatments, each year, the industry, we make advancements in seed treatments when it comes to insect and disease control. Um, we're working on traits, we're working on biologicals. There's a lot of um, new products in this space. Um, when we think of humics, when we think of microbes uh, within that biological uh, sphere. We also try to consider management. The way I farm is probably not the way you farm. The way you farm is probably very different than even your next door neighbor. So when we think about all these factors, again, we're just focusing on one hybrid throughout all of these details, but how does this one hybrid uh, respond to cover crop, planting date, application, split timings, and fungicide? So when we think about how we place genetics by environment, by management, this is a tall ask. There's a lot of different factors. And I know if you're probably seated in Illinois this morning, I think you can probably fully recognize that someone in Southern Michigan may farm a little different than you. The tougher task to accept is if you are sitting um, in Kokomo, Indiana, 
there's a high probability of your next door neighbor farming different than you, whether it be tillage or timing or what have you. There's always differences among, and it's up to us as a seed bet, a brand to truly deliver as much knowledge to you as possible to make sure uh, you are focused on the ROI per acre. So <clears throat> you've heard me say it a few times on this call, this genetics by environment by management. Internally, we say the same thing. We take soils by genetics, by management. Let's start off here uh, with soils. Okay, I, I think we can all gladly um, accept the fact that you probably farm more than one soil type. Um, yes, even you guys in central Illinois. We have more than one soil type. We know that those soil types have different CECs. We know that those soil types have different water holding capacities. So when we think about those soil, when we think about growing corn first, you have to think about that soil. Where are we at? What can we build off of? So for example, if we take a look here at this lower soil test uh, report and we take a look at this field labeled as Jack, okay? We can see that soil uh, pH is 6.9. We can see that our potassium is at 65, which is considered very low. And we can talk about this percentage of potassium. And when I get kind of nerdy about it, I think about, the hybrid I would choose for this field labeled Jack needs to be very different, very different than the hybrid I choose for Oklahoma. And the in this Jack field needs to be very different than this organic matter of 3.2 up, up here in this soil test. So starting with that soil test is, is where we truly need to be. And, and here's a little build up of the why, guys. The first an easiest thing you can do to affect your ROI on, far, on your farm outside of tile is getting that pH correct. And I know that you all have probably seen this uh, before, but here's the why. At 6.8 on the pH scale is when you have the strongest natural release of fertility within your soil. If you get that to drop to about 6.3, you can readily see you may start to have some phosphorus issues you might start to have some mag issues and just changing with that pH of that soil can be truly, truly impactful. Well, let's take it a step further. So when we read those soil test reports, again, this is before we plant any seed. You could take the same hybrid that David Hula yielded 616 and plant it. But if we start with a soil pH of 6.3, you're never going to get there. Okay, so here's some parameters. When we think about soil pH, let's, let's shoot for that 6.8. I, I think that's a, a fairly um, universally held thought. Let's get this right first. Second, let's take a look at that potassium level. Okay, this is very aspirational. Um, this is progress. This is not perfection. When we take a look at those K levels, having a 0.9 K level is a very bad place to be. Okay. Thinking getting that number closer to four, and if you can stretch it to six, that'd be a really great percentage of K to be in that cat, cat iron saturation. Mag, as in when you're in the Eastern Corn Belt, mag levels being high um, do not seem to be an issue. Typically our mag levels are a little too high, which therefore can tie up other nutrients such as calcium. So when we think about getting that uh, magnesium level a little lower, um, to express that calcium because of that binding site on your CEC. Um, these are numbers that were pretty aspirational to get to. And again, doesn't matter if you plant the world's best hybrid, if we have these soil tests um, that are out of balance, um, it's going to be very difficult for us to be able to achieve those results. So starting with that soils, so that soils by genetics. Okay, this is when I start to get kind of nerdy myself. And I think about what that plant can deliver based on its genetic package. So what am I talking about? I really like to sort this out by root type, ear type, and by leaf type, okay? Um, <clears throat> if your agronomist today doesn't carry a shovel in the back of their truck, um, let me know. We'll, we'll make sure that we get that taken care of because when we think about growing corn, we have to understand what's going on above, below ground. Everything you see above ground is a mirror image to a below ground. And I really wanna focus on that root type that we're trying to grow with. 
Now, we think out west in Arizona, we think about cactuses. Think about that root system. It's very small. It's towards the surface. And the whole idea is when it rains, we can gather up as much rain as possible quickly to be able to sustain life in that plant. So very similar to a corn root, we would call that a fibrous root system. Think about if you were to take this fibrous root system, which is very droughty, sandy fields, and we plant that on a clay. Okay, we, we plant that on a clay from Ohio that is cold, it is a tight clay, and roots really don't permeate throughout that soil very well. What would happen to that plant? Okay, conversely, a clay soil, you want that clay soil to be able to go down and, and mine that soil. There are times of the year where in a clay, water is readily available, but typically when you get to late July and August, you really need to seek all the water available through that profile to be able to pick it up and run with it. So finding that root type that fits your soils best is important, okay? Many of these, all your nutrients come up through either mass flow, through root interception or diffusion. So understanding where those roots are at based on our management is very important, okay? So let's take this a step further. Take a look at the, the photo on the screen. You have a larger root system on your left. Um, you can see uh, with the University of Illinois ruler, it's about 12 inches versus that root system there on the right. So the, the added age question, which one would you choose? Okay, without thinking too much, we would say, um, you know, in America, bigger is better, right? So I want this larger root system. But here's something to consider as well we can change that rooting mass as we change population. So let's consider the fact if, if we're, our, we're a farmer, we have water available in our soil mostly throughout the year, we have yield um, aspirations of 275 bushels an acre, what root system do you wanna take out there? Okay, when you make a root, you are using sugar and you are using energy to grow roots. Okay, so it's a balancing act. We wanna grow enough so we're fully anchored in that soil that we can mine that profile for water and nutrients, but we don't want too much root because when we grow that, we then tend to give up some of our yield aspirations as well. So the takeaway here is that your population can affect that rooting size. And if we take that population to affect that rooting size, then what's our next play here? Okay, here's, here's our genetics that, that come through. Genetically, innately, we have different root expressions. We can think of hybrids with large rooting systems. We can think of hybrids with, with narrow rooting systems. But then when it comes to applying ROI on that farm, how do we get the most out of that root system? If we're pushing populations, we have a smaller root system. Being able to broadcast a nutrient maybe is not the most effective way to apply that nutrient, right? We're in that good, better, best type of mindset. Whereas if you start with a really large root system to, to start, maybe your management doesn't need to be so focused on banding. Maybe you can get away with a little bit more broadcast within your management. So um, at the end of the day, this is, this is very aspirational. I, I know that not everybody's logistics will allow for this fertilizer placement. But I think the topic to consider is based on genetics, based on environment, how we apply those nutrients. Are we forcing the corn to fit our management or are we changing our management to fit those hybrids? Okay, ear type, we have fixed and we have flex hybrids. Innately, we'd probably go here to the right and choose the bigger ear, right? But when we think about flex and fixed, if we have a soil that's gonna hold water, we might wanna be looking a little bit more towards a fixed hybrid. If we have a little bit droughtier area, that flex hybrid is going to fill the gap, be able to take advantage of, of sunlight to make sugars, to make yield. So understanding your ear type so we can fit that population best is absolutely critical. Gotta focus on the roots, gotta focus on the ear. And what's the last part to focus on? It's our leaf architecture. This gets a little nerdy and I like it. Think about, your sandier soils that don't hold water. Do you want a leaf that is upright to have more leaf, have more sunlight striking that soil surface? Or do you want a little bit more pendulum of a leaf? 
Here you can see through hybrid B in this example, you see some of that sunlight hitting that soil surface. Okay, that's lost photosynthetic capability. Versus hybrid A, where we look down that row and we don't see any of that sunlight hitting um, that soil surface. So considering our soils, considering our root type and considering our leaf type is very important when it comes to choosing that proper hybrid for our farms. And the last thing I wanted to touch on before I kick it over to Brad is that corn is a very easy equation to determine yield, right? We take number of years times kernel rows round times kernel length times kernel weight. It's a very easy equation. Well, what makes it very difficult is, is trying to figure out the times of the year um, to which we can truly be impactful, right? If we start with a 16 kernel row round to start, that means we've got to retain all of those, that length of kernels. It means we need to grow that kernel depth. And the point of this slide, if you don't have um, the fertilizer um, app on your phone, um, you can go ahead and search this out. Um, it's by Ag PhD. You can type in your yield goal and it's gonna give you a really good ballpark opinion on how many pounds of nutrients you need. And my lasting um, comment on this, we all aspire for 250 bushel corn, right? Or dependent, you know, if you're in dry corners in Nebraska, we're probably trying to get to 175. The takeaway here is yield just doesn't happen. If we don't feed that crop to get that yield expectation, okay, we're, we're shortchanging ourselves. So feeding that crop, the, the proper pounds per bushel of nutrient we need to start is very, very critical. So Brad, with that, sir, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to keep on this yield theme, and uh, I want to pose the question of, in your field, what is typically your most limiting factor? You have a couple different options there. Is it your, your hybrid, uh, crop nutrition, pests, that could be disease, insects, or weeds? Um, is it the weather, something that we can't control? Or at this point, are you really not sure what's your most limiting yield factor? Give you a couple seconds to, to vote here. All right, so we have our, our results. Um, a few of you say that your, your hybrid um, is your most limiting yield factor. And, and you know, as Stephanie was talking about, you know, we can, we can help match the environment and the, the management to hopefully improve that. Um, crop nutrition has, is 18%. Um, pests, seems like most people are doing a pretty good job controlling pests with only 3%. Um, as I expected, the weather, that pesky weather, something that uh, we cannot control um, is often most yield limiting factor, whether that's too dry, too wet, um, wet wind damage, things, things of that sort. And a couple of you are not sure, which, which is, is typical. A lot of times uh, we don't always know what's the most limiting uh, yield factor in our field. And, and that's really what uh, my team is, is here to help with and, and um, help answer some of these questions and dig down to how we can help improve our yield. So my group focuses on um, small plot research. Uh, we conduct trials all throughout the Midwest. You can see all the locations where we have trials. Um, we're, we're doing this in small plot using small plot research equipment. Um, of those locations, there's really about nine that are our core locations where we really do a lot of agronomy related topics. And, and we pretty much focus on um, um, anything that you can think of that is related to, to agronomy. So just some examples of what we looked at in uh, the 2022 growing season. Uh, that top picture on the left there, that was looking at um, precision fertilizer placement um, with the planter. And you can see that growth enhancement there of, of where we applied that. That middle picture in the top, um, that's where we are actually trying to control the weather. Um, we can't always control that, but we, we gave it our best attempt. And we were using uh, surface drip irrigation to actually create saturated soils or even some ponding to see how hybrids handle wet feet and if it's economical for a grower to go out there and, and, and um, try and rescue that corn with a nitrogen application. Uh, picture on the top right, we, we dig a lot of roots, evaluate a lot of hybrid root structures, and also um, looking at different corn rootworm traits. Um, if anybody is free in July or the end of July, well, we always have more power washers available. 
That bottom picture on the left, um, you might have seen that if you attended the webinar last week. That's a, a seed treatment study in soybean we did. Pretty severe SDS in that field, and that, that green strip in the middle of that um, picture was where Saltro was applied. That really suppressed and controlled a lot of that SDS symptomology. That middle picture on the bottom, we're uh, looking at um, corn seeding depth study this year. And that last picture uh, was actually a cover crop study, that's cereal rye, and we had, you can see different blocks there of no cover crop versus cover crop, and then also two different termination timings. So we were either um, planting green or we terminated that cover crop um, two weeks early uh, before planting. So all of this information, and this is just a very a small snippet of the trials we do. We do a lot more trials than this, but all that information and all the results uh, can be found in the 2023 Agronomy in Action and Research Review Book. Um, the uh, digital copy for this will be out in late February. That'll be online. And then printed copies should be available um, early to mid-March um, if anybody's uh, interested in that. So I'm going to keep moving on and, and um, really continue to talk about this uh, G by E by M um, interaction. And I'm going to spend the rest of the time really focusing on the management piece of this and why that's important. Because if you think about historically how seed companies have recommended hybrids and placed hybrids, it's mostly um, just focused on the environment. You know, seed companies, they, they do hybrid evaluations across a lot, a lot of different environments throughout the Midwest. Um, but the hard part's the management part. And that's really what separates Golden Harvest from everybody else is, is we focus on that management part and it's difficult to do. And we're really trying to match um, the, the hybrid to the environment and uh, that management piece as well. So we, we conduct studies. Um, I'm going to talk about one that we did in, in 2021. Um, we had two different management styles, so a, a, a standard uh, grower practice um, compared to an enhanced system. And in that, we had a couple different management uh, factors, uh, fertility, nitrogen, fungicide, and population. So in that standard system, depending on the location, uh, either P and K was broadcast or there was no additional uh, fertilizer applied depending on the soil test levels. And we didn't apply any additional sulfur or micronutrients. The, the nitrogen was just a base rate of nitrogen and that rate kind of depended on the, the location. Um, there was no fungicide applied and we had two different populations. In the enhanced system, we used precision fertilizer placement all applied with the planter. We put some nutrients in furrow, two by two by two, and some surface uh, dribble bands off the back of the planter. The nitrogen, well, we were adding an additional 70, 70 pounds with the planter, and then we also side dressed in another 60 pounds of nitrogen in that enhanced system. Uh, the, and then the, for the fungicide, we have us added Mirvis Neo at R1, and then we also had those same two populations in the enhanced system. So here's what that looked like at one of our locations. This was Geneseo last year. And we can see that side-by-side -side comparison. This is the same hybrid planted on the same day um, in that standard system versus the enhanced system. You can see there's actually some sulfur deficiency on that corn on the left there compared to the, that corn on the right. And this was early on in the season and even later in the season, that picture on the right, we can still see that extreme growth enhancement. Um, at this point, it, the only difference is it received that additional uh, precision fertilizer uh, placement at planting. So we did this at eight different locations last year. Um, here are the yield results. So on average, we were getting about a 19 bushel uh, yield response across all locations. But as you can see, depending on the location, um, we had a wide range of response. So, so Sac City, we saw a small, small yield difference there of only three bushels. Uh, in Nebraska, we really didn't see any yield enhancement from that uh, system at all, but also a very high yielding location there. Then you compare that to uh, a Clinton at 19 bushels, a Keystone, we had 25 bushel response. And the big one there was Geneseo, that picture I just showed, uh, we were looking at a 51 bushel response to that enhanced management system. And, and what this really shows is that there is yield to be gained um, in these fields. So how does that compare, or how does that look between the, the different hybrids? We had a bunch of different hybrids in this study, and here's an example. This is at the Slater, Iowa location. A couple of differences between these hybrids and how they responded to that precision fertilizer placement. So 
The, the two I really want to point out here is that G15, J91, very large response to that precision fertilizer placement um, compared to that G12S75, you know, still had a nice response, but just not nearly as great as that, that 15J91. So I'm going to focus on the, uh, the Geneseo location, mainly because that was the location where we had the highest yield responses last year. Um, I also picked uh, four hybrids here. I, I picked these four because they're very diverse in how they responded to, to management and population. So if you look at those four hybrids in the standard management, um, you can see that they a lot three of the four yielded very similar. But really that G12S75 was that one hybrid that really stuck out as, as being the highest yielding um, in that standard management. Now you compare that to the enhanced management, that next column, that's the yield gained um, for each of those hybrids when we were under that more intensive system. And you notice that these hybrids responded differently. So um, two of those hybrids, about 30, 35 bushel response, that G10L16, we had a, a 54 bushel response. And the one that really liked management, uh, likes to be fed, likes foliar protection, is that G15, J91. We saw 71 bushel response to the management with that particular hybrid. And if you think about that, if, you're, if this was your field and you were selecting what hybrid would be the best to be placed on this field, um, you know, really depending on what management you're, you're doing. If you're, you're kind of doing a basic management uh, program, uh, you'd be selecting that G12S75. But that was the highest yielding hybrid for that. But if you're really pushing it, um, really feeding that crop, uh, you apply a fungicide and insecticide, um, it's that G15J91 that's, that's going to be the highest yielding hybrid on that farm. So it, again, it really depends on what management style. And that's what our group is doing is trying to match that for your given environment and field. So let's look at the, the population component, that last column there. So that's, that's also the, uh, the yield increase over that standard management at, at 34,000 plants per acre. So you can see, I um, really wanna focus on those 210 day hybrids, those two hybrids at the top there. Again, if you look at the, the, the yield increase to management, that G, 10L16 was more responsive, but when it comes to population, we only saw an additional 10 bushels gained when we added that uh, more plants compared to that ND21, we saw a 30 bushel response when we put another 10,000 plants out there. So that G10D21 was a much more responsive hybrid to population. If you wanna get the most yield out of that hybrid, you need to, to increase your population, you increase your seeding rate, and manage that hybrid as well. So that was in, in 2021. So in, in this past growing season, we really wanted to expand on these trials. And we worked with the local Golden Harvest agronomists and we we're actually uh, implemented some on-farm replicated strip trials. So these would be full field trials um, using, using standard equipment. And we were comparing it versus a standard and enhanced program, and that really depended on, on the location. So um, it's whatever was typically a, a standard program would be done in that area. And then the enhanced program uh, depended on, on what kind of equipment was available and um, really just trying to, to take that standard uh, and advance it a little bit more, whether that was a side dress application, maybe if you could um, put on some fertility with the planter and also add a fungicide but it, it, it depended on the location and what kind of uh, system we were working with. So here's an example in Stacyville, Iowa, some of the equipment that was used. This was a, a tractor and planter that was set up to put on uh, fertility and, and biologicals um, through the planter. Also, uh, there's a side dress bar. We were able to, to side dress some additional nutrients, some nitrogen and sulfur. And then also there's a fungicide added at this location as well. And that was all on top of the, uh, the standard program. Here's a pretty neat NDVI image of this location, taking it in season. Uh, you could see the different strips of, of enhanced and standard strips. This would have been uh, replicated three times here. Each one of these strips has four hybrids and each hybrid is six rows wide. So it was a 12 row planter. We split the planter with two hybrids, um, planted the trial and then, and then swapped out for another two hybrids and planted it again. And you can see from this picture, uh, the how well that enhanced management 
is, is keeping those plants alive throughout the, the rest of the growing season. And those, those plants are a lot healthier, showing up as much more green in those strips um, compared to the standard uh, strips. The other thing you'll notice is that if you, you look in that standard strip, you can see differences between the hybrids within the strip. So there's looks like one hybrid within that strip um, is, is senescing or, or drying down a little bit more quicker than, than the other hybrids. So here's an example of what that would look like in the field. Um, so this particular hybrid we're looking at is G99A37. Again, this is at the Stacyville, Iowa, Iowa location. Um, in the standard management on the left there, and then in the enhanced management on the right. And you can see how much healthier that canopy is um, in those pictures on the right there. Those plants are, are still photosynthesizing, um, still a lot of green leaf material there um, compared to that, that one on the left that's starting to uh, dry down a little bit quicker. Here's just a, another example. This is GO2K39. Um, these pictures are, are really quite different. So much greener canopy on the, the right there. And, and actually, if you look down that row, you really can't even see down the row because that canopy is still very healthy compared to in the standard management. You can really look down that, that row because those leaves have already started to, to droop and that plant is starting to shut down um, compared to that enhanced system. So here's what the, the yield results look like across the six locations where we implemented this study. Um, again, the, the uh, enhanced system tended to, to yield better and it really depended on the location. So the, those two Iowa locations on the right there, 35 bushel response um, compared to the, uh, the Minnesota location, we only saw six bushel response there. And uh, the magnitude of the responses that we were seeing was really driven um, on three key things. Um, one, it, it really depended on what the base system foundation was and what that intensive uh, fertility or enhanced management system was, because again, they differed. Um, also, there's different hybrids at these locations. And as we have, have shown here, that the response to management differs between hybrids. And then that last piece there is just the environment and, and what kind of weather patterns we got um, really affected the response that we got at these locations. So what about uh, the hybrid component? So we had four hybrids at each of these locations. So here I'm showing the, the yield response, and this would be the early season hybrid set. So from a 97 day to 102 day hybrids here, we had that at the Minnesota location and the Stacyville, Iowa location. Again, the responses were, were pretty minimal and we really didn't see much difference between the hybrids at that Minnesota, Minnesota location. But at that Stacyville, Iowa location, very responsive site. And you can see the two hybrids that really separated themselves from the other ones as being the, the two most responsive hybrids at this location was that G99A37 and the GO2K39, both a, a, above 40 bushel response to that enhanced management. Here's a look at the, the mid-season hybrid set. We had three locations of this. A couple main takeaways here is I really want to focus in on this G06A27. That was the most responsive hybrid across all three locations. So 34 bushel response in Clinton, 47 bushel response in Nevada, and a 30 bushel response in Sumner, Iowa. Now the G08R52 was, was pretty responsive hybrid as well at two of the three locations. Um, it wasn't quite as responsive at the, uh, the Clinton location. And one example I want to show here is if we focus on this Clinton location and you're thinking about what hybrid, if, if that's my farm, what hybrid should I be selecting for that particular field? Well, if you're, if you're under um, uh, standard management and you're just comparing this, the 06A27 and the 07G73, well, you'd be selecting that 07G73 hybrid because that, that yielded greater. But if you're really in, in, in managing that crop, putting on a fungicide, uh, making sure it's the proper crop nutrition, um, you really want to be selecting that 06A27. That was by far the highest yielding hybrid um, under that intensive management system there. So again, it really depends on your management system and your field on what's the best hybrid to maximize your yield potential. And the last uh, set here, this was the late season hybrid set. Um, these hybrids weren't the exact same between the different locations, but this G11V76 stuck out as, the, as a very responsive hybrid at both locations. Um, and, and again, at that Clinton, Illinois location, that 15J91, 78 bushel response to that enhanced management system. So that's a very, very responsive hybrid. Um, you need to manage that hybrid um, if you want it to be successful on, on your farm. So 
what are some of the key takeaways from what I just showed? Well, the one, the one main thing that should be taken away is that, um, well, two things. One, that there's, you know, there's difference in how hybrids respond to management, but overall, you know, there's yield to be gained on these farms with improved management. So you may be asking yourself, well, you know, we are really throwing an intensive program um, at these hybrids, but are there some agronomic factors or, or management timings that are more important than others? Well, we, we tried answering that question and uh, we, we implemented an omission addition plot design up in Wisconsin. And, and at that location, we had two golden harvest hybrids, a 00A97 and an O2K39. At that location, the entire field uh, received a, a banded rate of nitrogen, a pretty aggressive P and K and sulfur, and then also some micronutrients. So the entire trial received that. And then within that trial, we had two different management systems, again, looking at four different uh, production factors. The, uh, the standard management, we just didn't, we didn't add any additional uh, in-furrow fertility, no additional side dress, no fungicide, and it was planted at a, the lower population of 32,000 plants per acre. So that was the standard. The enhanced, we added uh, nitrogen, PK, zinc, and some uh, biostimulant in-furrow. Uh, we also added a side dress, of some nitrogen, sulfur, uh, PGR, and some micronutrients. Uh, we had a foliar application at R1 of, of Mirvis Neo fungicide uh, and some PGR and a biostimulant as well. And then in that enhanced system, we bumped up the population to 38,000 plants per acre. So the omission addition plot design, um, what we do is we take that standard system, that whole system, and then we will add one of the enhanced management practices at a time. So we'll add that in furrow application, or we'll add the side dress application, or we'll add the foliar application and so on. And so we can see how much yield is gained from each one of those management practices. On the flip side of that, the omission part of that is we'll take that full enhanced system, so all four of those practices, and we'll remove one of them at a time. So we'll, we'll leave out the in furrow application, or we'll leave out the side dress application, and we can see how much yield is lost when we remove one of those factors. And so that's what the omission addition plot design is all about. So here's just a picture of what we saw. Um, this was at the, uh, this was a visual image of the difference seen with the R1 foliar package. And you see that, that uh, leaf on the left there had severe tar spot. Uh, this leaf uh, died early, was not producing any photosynthesis because it had a, an early death from that severe tar spot. Compared to that picture on the right, where we applied that foliar package of, of uh, Mirvis Neo fungicide and some micronutrients and also a PGR, um, you know, there's still some tar spot there, but it was significantly less, and this, this leaf definitely photosynthesized later into the growing season. So taking a look at the yield results from this study. So again, in that standard management, um, just, just utilizing that base fertility program, and we achieved 206 bushels per acre. If we added just the, the in-furrow, we gained six bushels. The cydrus application was worth 19. The R1 foliar application was worth 20. And if we bumped up our population, uh, it was worth 13 bushels per acre. Now on the flip side of that, if we had that in full enhanced system, all four management factors, uh, we achieved 261 bushels an acre. But if we left out the in-furrow application, it set us back 13 bushels. If we left out the side dress, we went backwards 16. The uh, foliar application was worth 19 bushels. And then if we had everything going for us, we were really pushing it, had proper nutrition, foliar protection, but we didn't have enough plants and we only put 32,000 plants out there, um, that cost us 15 bushels an acre. So again, if you're really gonna be managing that crop, that's where you can start uh, pushing your population a little bit to take advantage of that, uh, that crop nutrition and foliar protection. So here's the, 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 uh, a different way of looking at this. This is a side-by-side -side of the previous two slides I just showed. And so again, comparing that standard management system where we got 206 bushels an acre, that enhanced, we got 261 bushels an acre. And I like showing this view because you can compare what adding one factor um, 
did in terms of yield compared to if we removed that one factor. And you'll notice that it, it, in this case, most of them were worth the same uh, amount of bushels in yield, except that inferro application. If we just added it, uh, it, we gained six bushels, but if we left it out, it cost us 13. So it was more detrimental to leave it out than it was to just add it. And what that kind of shows is that management is really all about a systems approach. I mean, you really got to have all those uh, management practices, um, kind of like a, a relay effect, getting that plant off to a good start early, setting that high yield potential, and then maintaining that high yield potential, you know, with the citrus application and, and foliar fungicide. Um, it's, it's, you just can't add one factor and, and think you're going to be uh, achieving these high yields. So I'm gonna wrap it up here. I'm um, just some some final key takeaways. Um, really, that that top one there, you know, like Stephanie was mentioning, you know, the world record corn yield is 616 bushels an acre. Um, you know, we didn't achieve that in our studies, but what our studies do show is that many of these farms have untapped yield potential that can be achieved through better crop management. Another takeaway is that, you know, we really hit home is that these hybrids respond differently to management and, and also to different environments and matching that hybrid to the right management style and environment is really how you maximize your yield potential. The third bullet there is, you know, we're, we're really pushing this crop, really looking at a, diff, a lot of different management factors and, and, you know, it's really not necessary to do all of them and, and really look at all these different products. Um, really, the key is, you know, before you get involved in that, it's it's really about determining what your limiting factor is and focus your management style on those factors. You know, if, if nitrogen is not your limiting factor and you're going to go put more nitrogen out there, well, you're, you're not going to see that yield benefit. It's really, you got to focus on your, your most limiting factors. And that last one there is, is, kind of just focuses on a lot of the trialing and, and work that we do looking at these hybrid by management system trials. It, and it really is what helps the Golden Harvest team help place that right hybrid on the right acre to maximize your yield potential. And I, I do want to have a little call out that if you are interested in participating in any of these hybrid by management trials, um, reach out to your local agronomist and we're always looking for more trials. Just a, a final slide here of what you should have been taking away from this uh, presentation today. So a couple of things that you should be leaving here and, and doing um, that first and foremost, you should really be finding a trusted advisor, whether that's your, your agronomist or, or a sales rep, you know, find somebody that you trust and, and ask a lot of questions to understand these products and understand hybrids. You should really be getting out and walking your advisor's plot um, probably multiple times throughout the season, see how these hybrids differ, differ within the same field on, on how, they, how they get out of the ground, um, their plant health. Um, also, you should be getting in your own field, uh, uh, dig roots, you should be pulling apart plants. One thing uh, that I really like to do that can really tell how hybrids are responding in a field is, is around the, the R3, R4 growth stage is, is cut open the lower stalk and, and see how healthy that stalk is. Um, if it's cannibalizing itself, you're probably running out of, of nutrients, probably nitrogen, um, or, or you may have some leaf disease out there and, and, and kind of see how these hybrids differ in their disease packages and how they're responding to fungicide. Also a great resource is the Golden Harvest Agronomy Research Summary Book that I talked about. And we have a lot of different management studies in there and, and across a lot of different environments and locations. So see what one matches your kind of field and environment and, and, and um, what kind of equipment that you have that can match some of the things that we're doing. Also, there's a lot of great third-party data out of there um, from different universities as well. So look at all those um, different resources and, and really be taking action and trying to improve your yields on, on your farm. I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Julia to wrap us up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brad. Great work, Stephanie and Brad. Uh, thanks for pulling together this presentation. I think we, we hit it spot on here in terms of the importance of that genetics by environment by management piece. So I appreciate your time here. Um, now it's time that we have about seven minutes here today to answer any questions that you all have um, among yourself in the audience here. Uh, first off, here's the question, or here's the contact for both of our presenters. If you want to take a quick kind of snippet of this slide, save their number, give them a call, kind of putting them on the spot here. But 
I know both of them are, are more than welcome to take your questions even offline here today. Um, with that, we're going to transition here. We have a question in the chat or in the Q&A box that says, are your enhanced strip trials built to be financially feasible across every acre? Brad, I think this came in when um, you were on the 2022 data. Uh, so if you could speak to that. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it, that management system really depended on the, the different locations that we're at. So, it, you know, in terms of the responses that we were seeing, it really depended on the location. But I think I, I really just want to hit home that we are really trying to, to push yield in these situations and that you really need to first start your focus on the most limiting factors um, and, and trying to identify what your most limiting factors are. Focus on those first, and once you have those corrected, that's where um, you can start looking at more in, enhanced system or, or using biologicals or, or PGRs um, to uh, to really push that yield to the next level. And and you'll notice that at some of those locations where we're getting you know 40 plus bushel response, you know yes, a lot of the, a lot of those cases they were economical to do that. But again, um, uh, really depending on the location and the, and the hybrid being used. Thanks, Brad. But we had another question come in that I think both of you um, could take a stab at, and that's what's the best way to help customers identify their most yield limiting factor? I'll take a swing at this one to start. And that's a really good question. And the answer to that question probably differs day to day or week to week, right? So we think about those, those growth stages that are very critical um, in determining yield of corn, right? So, you know, number of ears per acre. Uh, the limiting factor at that point in time could be too wet of soils or too dry of soils. Got to get that even emergence, right? And then we go through to that V4 to V5 when we're determining kernel rows round. When we think about limiting factors there, we, we typically tend to switch our mind into fertility mode. Do we have enough phosphorus? Do we have enough nitrogen to make sure we throw that? So your question is good. Um, how do we determine that? The, the basic question we're going to say is think about the growth stage you're in and nothing beats boots in the field. Take a shovel, pull that plant apart like Brad was talking about, split stalks. Um, there's a lot of algorithms out there that can help us um, with attention to some details, but nothing's going to trump walking those fields. Thank you, Stephanie. Any ad, Brad? Yeah, just just to echo what she said, to, to really understand your most limiting factors, it's really number one thing you can do is get in your field and, and evaluate what you're working with. And, and then the other thing is you can you could always put a, a couple small trials within your own field, a couple different strips, you know, add add a nutrient here and there and see if you're getting a response from it or and, you know, that could tell you a lot right there. Um, um, what maybe some of your limiting factors are. Great. Thank you, panelists. Another question that came in is, are you pulling soil samples from the research plot locations to uh, factor into your data results? Yeah, absolutely. We pull uh, soil samples from all of our locations. Um, I didn't show it uh, today, um, but it is in that uh, Grimey Research Review book. It shows our, our soil samples there. A lot of the a lot of our locations are actually pretty sufficient on, on P and K. Um, there are a couple, uh, mostly out out west, where we are a little deficient on P and K. So, and that's where we tend to get a little bit higher responses as well to these fertility practices. Thanks, Brad. Uh, one more question here: pH and no-till. It seems that after ten plus years of zone sampling, that pH values are slow to respond to lime. Assuming my equation and line up. Lime numbers are correct. How do I correct pH quicker? Chris, I appreciate the question, sir. Thanks for asking. Um, when we get into some of those no-till situations, it, it does become trickier, right? Um, typically, we get stratification layers uh, across, whether that be fertility, whether that be pH. Um, and, and when we think about that, you know, that question almost asks for that same answer, a G by E by M. So you've got a stratified soil probably. Uh, thinking about that soil type, how do you get that nutrient to cycle and that pH to cycle? I would think a really good way in a no-till system would be cover crops. We get some of that root movement, we get to break up perhaps some of that stratification across those layers. I, I think cover cropping can, can really help us um, be able to transition that pH a little quicker. Um, 
there, there are differences in management when it comes to those type of systems. Great, and I have one last question, and that is that there are so many different equipment options and products out in the market um, in terms of management. Um, for individuals that just looking to start, kind of any direction that you have to give on maybe a good starting point from either of the panelists today. Oh, Brad, we can arm wrestle over this one. Um, <laughs> I'll go first, Brad. Um, in my opinion, I, I, I tend to oversimplify and go back to that yield equation. Number of years per kernel rose round. So to me, that starts with the planter. I want to make sure I have uniform depth of seed placement and uniform spacing of seed placement. And I want to start as many times as possible with 18 kernel rows round. And typically that means an on the planter fertilizer system delivering phosphorus, nitrogen, and sulfur. So um, to your question, that is where I would start. Make sure that planter, you know, I would assume to start the table stakes would be you have spacing and depth figured out, really focusing on your nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, zinc delivery. Yeah, and just to add on that is, is we've been talking about, you know, pretty aggressive management today and, and really pushing that crop. Um, but I, we cannot forget about the basics either. And the basics being um, some of the things that Stephanie at home is proper seed spacing, proper planter depth, um, proper soil preparation, um, um, seed treatments, just your basic agronomy. Um, don't forget about that first, because a lot of these additional enhanced managements, you may not see much benefit to them if you don't have your basics um, down first. Great. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Stephanie. We are at time for today. I appreciate everyone joining. I want to thank you for your time today. I hope you all have a fabulous Thursday, and we will see you next week uh, for another informative hour. So thank you, everyone. That concludes our call.